Great. Okay. So welcome back to the second session of the of the workshop. Um, Anouk Malani uh, has uh, generously uh, agreed to step in uh, last moment. Uh, he is from the University of Chicago School of Law, and he will talk to us about vaccine allocation procurement using disease surveillance and economic data. Um, Anouk, the floor is yours. Great. Thank you, Flavio. Uh, so this is joint work with uh, Satej Soman, Sabarish Ramachandran, Alice Chen, and Dras Laktawala. Uh, let me give you a little bit of motivation here. So um, a lot of this work is motivated by our work uh, uh, with various uh, governments, uh, the Indonesian central government and provinces and the Philippine national government. That's work through the Asian Development Bank. Uh, and then work with the Indian states, which is just based upon relationships I have with a, a number of, uh, of, of, of bureaucrats at different states uh, in India. And, and the sorts of questions that motivated this particular work are listed here. So, uh, you know, this is uh, uh, this work that starts in late 2020 when it comes clear that there's a vaccine online, but there's uh, even in India an awareness uh, that uh, it's going to be slow uh, uh, going in terms of producing enough doses for the population. So what they want to know is, well, how should we allocate this? Uh, in what priority should we allocate insufficient doses? That's typically a question uh, that uh, will come from either lead bureaucrats in a state or a Ministry of Health, say, uh, in Indonesia. Um, then there's a second question that comes typically from ministries of finance in, in, in these countries, uh, which is how many doses should we procure? Obviously, the question is different for India, which is producing uh, versus uh, Indonesia and uh, the Philippines, which is procuring. Uh, and it's also actually different at the state level because uh, the states actually have to buy in India uh, extra doses beyond what the national government uh, allows. But that's typically a question from the finance folks. Um, and uh, it's important throughout this that, that people have uh, different uh, goals. Uh, so sometimes people, uh, they care about health, but they debate whether or not it should be lives or life years, or whether it should be something like social value or some people worth a little bit more than others uh, in cities, for example. Um, and if you go talk to the chief ministers, the chief ministers who have a broader constituency also will care, uh, for example, about the economy and how that's doing. So we wanted to consider these things uh, in the context of, uh, you know, some sort of framework to think about both the disease uh, and the value of life and the role that economics or economic activity plays in that value of life. Okay, so here's an overview of the framework that we used uh, to advise these governments. And again, this is a framework that developed over time. So at the very beginning, it was very crude, and then later on, got a little bit more sophisticated, but obviously you'll see towards the end, there's still major gaps. Um, so the first thing we, we do is we start with uh, uh, asking the question, how do cases and deaths vary with vaccination? For that, we use a, uh, a simulation of a stochastic uh, SIRD model, uh, uh, and we look at how uh, vaccines, we implement various vaccine strategy that, uh, at various rates, that is to say different priority systems at different vaccination rates per year uh, to see, and, and you know, kind of implemented within this SIRD model uh, to see what the effect is on cases. We try to calibrate those models uh, based upon local case data and serological work. Uh, in India, a lot of that serological work is work that we also did. Um, then the second thing we do is we calculate the value of a life or a value of a life year. We posit that it's a function of consumption, uh, but um, we don't just take consumption as a given. That is to say, we don't you know, take some pre-COVID level of consumption, assume it's static. You, know, you could do something like that for VSL or VSLY, uh, but we're actually gonna allow uh, that uh, for the possibility that as cases change, uh, increase or decrease, consumption can increase or decrease as people return to economic activity or not. Uh, and so we're actually going to develop a consumption forecasting model that allows consumption to change uh, with cases and therefore with the level of vaccination. Then the third thing we do uh, is we value different vaccination strategies based upon the different, different methods of valuing death. Uh, so as I said before, the value of a death we're going to allow to depend on consumption. Uh, just a standard economic model for this, uh, but you could also get it through VSL or VSLY, but consumption is going to depend on cases uh, through steps one and two above. So I'll go through in detail what goes on, but some of the things that, that influence us is, is this idea that the social willingness to pay uh, for vaccination actually declines uh, with time. Uh, you vaccinate the higher value guys first, your prioritization uh, rigs that. A second issue is that uh, as, you, as time goes on, 
uh, disease actually spreads too. Uh, remember, the infection doesn't stop uh, even as you're vaccinating. Uh, and uh, so the, the number of people that are left unimmunized and thus have a really higher value of vaccination uh, declines over time. But at the same time, there's some parts of this that suggest that social willingness to pay will rise over time. So for example, as you vaccinate more, uh, you can imagine that uh, economic activities rise, uh, that leads to more consumption, leads to higher willingness to pay uh, for vaccination, for life and thus for vaccination. So we're gonna generate a dynamic demand curve uh, based on this dynamic, based on these, these trade-offs. Okay, so that's an overview, but let me get into the details. Um, so here's our epidemiologic model. It's, uh, as I said, a stochastic SIRD model. Uh, it's based upon old, old work, our initial models uh, when we're advising uh, Indian governments on NPIs back in 2020. Uh, uh, and it's also based on some uh, uh, innovations uh, in doing the simulation and estimating RT from Betancourt and Soman in 2021. Uh, so the SIR model is obviously uh, at the top right. It's, uh, you can see the top row will have your SIRD. And then what we do to this is add a vaccination system, which is these things subscripted by VM. So you basically uh, can get vaccinated. Some are going to have an ineffective vaccine and they're going to be able to go through the cycle and get infected, although we're going to shut down death. Um, uh, and that's basically uh, the structure. There's a lot of, of degrees of freedom here. I think they're way better SIRD models. Uh, to set up uh, that account for vaccines, uh, but this is just a start. Uh, it's stochastic, so our stochastic uh, process is here. These are total number of cases, which then impact, uh, uh, and you have total number of recoveries and deaths, and that'll, you back out from that infection. So this is the, the betancourt Saman structure. It's gonna depend on local uh, reproductive rate, which we estimate directly from uh, case data uh, in each locale. So the locale is a district, so it's a district level model. Previously, we'd allowed for migration across districts. Here we don't. Again, it's very obvious that we don't account for reinfection, which is something that we're presently working on. Um, the models that are not estimated from the data, we get from the literature. So things like the recovery rate gamma uh, or uh, death rates uh, can come from the literature, although we can estimate that as well. Uh, as I said, we estimate uh, RT uh, from uh, case data, which we get from COVID19India.org. So again, an important part of what we're trying to do is use as much local data as possible rather than just kind of posit some parameters that seem realistic. Um, now, when we start this model out, you have to initialize it based upon uh, where you currently are. So for example, we ran the model starting in uh, June uh, 2021 forward, uh, the last time we, uh, you know, the, the version that we wrote up here, um, you have to figure out where you are in terms of the fraction of the population that are already uh, infected uh, and thus immunized. And so we get that by actually relying on our own serological work, which is done in multiple states, but I think best done in, in Tamil Nadu. Uh, and so we use the Tamil Nadu data and extrapolate to other parts of India uh, based upon the, the relative degree of uh, uh, the urbanization rate. Uh, in different uh, places, because that's the biggest gradient on which you see variation uh, in, uh, in you know, prior infection rates in, in, in seroprevalence. Okay, so that's your epidemiological model. Now you gotta include some, there are kind of big, uh, I would say big innovation, I'd say one innovation uh, is uh, our consumption forecasting model. This allows consumption to change with cases. We have a very rudimentary model, uh, forecasting model, and again, again, another degree of freedom uh, for, for, the, for, the, for the analyst. But here we've got consumption is gonna be a function of uh, the number of infections and the local number of deaths. Uh, and then you can have fixed effects uh, for various things like time fixed effects, uh, location fixed effects, uh, and the like. Um, so this is your consumption forecasting model. Uh, and what you're gonna do is you're gonna use the simulation to generate uh, variation in IND when you actually uh, project out. But first you gotta estimate this off of real data to get these parameter estimates. Where do we get that? Well, in India, we're very fortunate. We have access to a very large panel data set that uh, gives basically monthly data uh, going back to 2015 all the way uh, uh, to the latest data is from uh, October of 2021. Uh, and so we're able to use those data uh, to uh, estimate this model. And then we can plug in our epi model to generate I's and D's, uh, which we can then use to forecast consumption. Uh, okay. Um, now, a really interesting question that you could uh, ask is, well, uh, I could see how aggregate levels of infection or death affect my consumption right here for an individual, uh, but how does my vaccination uh, affect that? 
how's that included in here? Now that's very hard to estimate because we don't, you know, when we were estimating this, we didn't have a high rate of vaccination. There's enough, not enough variation uh, to really estimate the role of personal vaccination on, on this. Also our data don't include personal vaccination data. So we couldn't estimate that. So you can kind of, if you wanted to, you could structure it and say, all right, um, I can assume, uh, for example, that personal vaccination makes no data a difference. It's just whatever is happening in the aggregate uh, in terms of economic activity affects my consumption. Or you can say, hey, if you, uh, this is an extreme assumption, uh, if you get vaccinated, your consumption goes back to whatever your consumption was in 2019 before the pandemic hit. You could do it either way. We are going to do the naive way where there's only an aggregate effect, no individual effect uh, in, the, in what I'll show you. Uh, but the main thing that happens when you allow for an individual effect is that if you wanted to include private demand in the analysis, you could. We're not going to do that right here, uh, but we can talk a little bit more about that. And these are just methodological choices you can make. So what are the vaccination strategies we choose? Uh, well, typically we assume that within each jurisdiction, you can pursue one of three strategies, random assignment, which is self-explanatory, minimizing mortality, which means basically age-based prioritization. Uh, and the third is minimizing infection, which is based upon uh, going to those with uh, vaccinating first those with the highest contact rates. Of course, to do this, you need some mortality rate data. That's easy enough, I think. Uh, but the minimizing infection requires contact rate uh, uh, information. Uh, and there, often people will use various uh, uh, kind of uh, extrapolations based upon a few countries uh, for contact rates, age-based uh, contact rates uh, that have been developed. Um, we do something different. Again, we rely on local data. We use uh, uh, Luxman Iron et al., a science paper that looks at uh, uh, um, contact tracing uh, to back out contact rates. So that's what we're using here. We do different valuation methods. So there's VSL, uh, where you va value a life, uh, a, you know, a number of years times the, the, the uh, expected life, uh, you know, total life expectancy. Uh, that can be based on a static consumption level. You can do VSLY, where again, you have different valuations of different people, but the, it based on, you can make it based on their consumption, say in 2019. But we do something more Whereas VSL and VSLY typically hold consumption constant over time, um, uh, or at least just a fixed profile, age profile over time, if you think of Murphy Topel, um, you can actually be more sophisticated. You can actually look at how, uh, uh, as the epidemic evolves or as vaccination evolves, consumption changes. Uh, and then you can get a more kind of dynamic estimate of social value where uh, you're starting with the Murphy Topel version where your willingness to pay uh, is a function of <clears throat> your probability of survival each period times your consumption each period, but allowing the consumption to change over time based on, say, your forecasting model. You do something like this. You can do this with and without vaccination. You take the difference, and that's the willingness to pay for a particular vaccination strategy. And here, this is just a kind of more detailed version of it. You have to, the kind of the, the, the interesting part of it is you have to account for the probability that you're going to be vaccinated given the vaccination strategy when you calculate your, willing, your, your value, individual value, uh, or the value to a particular individual of getting vaccinated. It's not a private value. It's a social value from vaccinating that person in total. You calculate that for each person and then you aggregate to get a social willingness to pay. Again, I want to be very clear about this. This is not a private valuation, what you're, will, you're personally willing to pay. It's the social value from vaccinating a particular person. Okay. And so that's what we're, we're getting out here. Uh, the key, again, key difference between VSLY and this is that now I allow my consumption to change over time as I vaccinate people. Okay, one of the nice things about the structure is that you can do things like decompose willingness to pay into changes in health, like the changes in survival as you vaccinate more people, and also the changes in consumption, because uh, as you vaccinate more people, cases go down, consumption increases, which increases your valuation. Okay, so you can do that sort of decomposition. It's also the case that you can now think about demand curves uh, in an interesting way, and that's really relevant to procurement. Um, you can plot a static demand curve, which is just, you know, uh, take everybody in society, calculate their valuation, plot it in reverse order, right? That's a demand curve. But the problem is that each day that demand curve is going to move as you vaccinate people, because then they're not going to be, you know, once you get infected or once you get vaccinated, you have less willingness to pay. Also, you're, you're knocking off some people as you're vaccinating them. So you actually want to uh, plot, you know, the portion of each day's demand curve that you actually satisfy with vaccination and how that changes over time. And that's your total demand curve dynamically, and that is what should guide your, um, your procurement. So I'm going to show you how that's, uh, I'm going to show you an example of that. Okay, quickly go through results. So this is um, uh, just some background uh, information. So here we're, we're going to focus on India as a whole, uh, although we do the analysis at the district level and for each of the states, 
uh, I'm going to just kind of quickly give you uh, an India snapshot and a, a Tamil Nadu snapshot. So this is just wave one. Uh, we began our analysis during uh, wave two, uh, which is around the time that we were actively discussing vaccine priority. So that's what you're seeing here going up until June 2021. So you can think this is the before period. Uh, uh, these are vaccination rates. They're, they're, they're uh, um, uh, fairly low. Uh, here now we are using the epi model uh, in a no vaccination world to project out death rates. Uh, again, we're just at the beginning of the delta wave when we start. Uh, or towards the middle of it, I should say. And so you see a, an increase in death rate and then decline that we're projecting out. We also see the same thing. We see consumption fall uh, as death rates rise, which is actually what does happen. And then after that ends, you see an increase. Obviously, you don't see the Omicron uh, uh, um, wave, and that's because we have no reinfection in the model and, and we haven't uh, uh, modeled in or considered variants, new variants of concern. Okay, so again, a weakness, uh, but this is what we were doing in, in mid-2021. All right, so then we can start valuing different vaccination strategy using the, the, the methodology we do. And you get some interesting results. And so here's what we're presenting here. We're looking at a uh, table of figures that are very similar. Uh, you're going to vary the vaccination rate here. The vaccination rate is can either be, you don't vaccine at all, this is your benchmark. You vaccinate a quarter of the population per year, that's 25%, half the population per year, and in the entire population per year and then stop once you do vaccinate once with two doses uh, or you vaccinate everybody in six months that's 200 percent basically and then you stop and what you see is uh if you're just looking for example uh, valuing uh you know prioritizing deaths only not even value of deaths um mortality rate prioritization does the best this is unsurprising this is not unique to this paper um what is interesting though is that uh random vaccination does better than contact rate vaccination and you can see that here and the reason why uh, is because random, you at least pick up some old people, whereas with contact rate, those people are not the highest priority. Uh, and so you can actually do better that way. Just showing, you know, this kind of interesting twist when you have such a strong age gradient. Another thing that's interesting that comes out of this is prioritization is better than speed. So for example, let's suppose that you can prioritize, but you can't, so you can, you can go very fast as long as you don't prioritize, say do it randomly, um, or you could prioritize, but have to be much slower. Uh, so you can compare this uh, by saying, like, let's suppose that I'm going to prioritize but only cover 25% of the population in a year versus I'm going to randomly give it out. I'm going to give 100% of the population in a year. You still see that you do better versus slow in prioritization than fast and random. So I thought that was an interesting thing that that I think, uh, 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 you know, policymakers kind of took seriously, at least seemed like they took seriously um, in places like uh, like India. Now, the here you've got deaths, you've got years of life loss, very similar pattern. Here we give total economic value, which is that, that social willingness to pay. We call it total economic value. Um, and here, again, you get the same, you know, you still think mortality rate is better, but things contract a lot. And the reason they contract a lot is because the value that you give to the people with higher contract rates, uh, it, in turn, uh, in, in, in uh, sorry, let me rephrase that. People with higher contact rates, they're less likely to die, but they have so higher social value because they more, they're more likely to be workers uh, and have higher income. Uh, and so that leads to some compression of the, of the value of the different strategies. Uh, and so that's what you see there. Interestingly, in India, they still took the, the um, uh, you know, they, they like the, the mortality rate approach, but in Indonesia, I think they latched on a little bit more to the fact that the, those with higher contact rates have higher economic value. Um, again, we didn't tell them what their objective function ought to be, uh, but, but we got the sense that that's something that they valued a little bit more. The other thing that we try to stress, but because is politically very problematic, is that we point out that the value of vaccination varies by location. So here you've got Punjab, Tamil Nadu, Maharashtra, West Bengal, Bihar. Uh, here's the value of vaccination for different age groups. And you see that, you know, you'd actually have to dip down, uh, you know, to say, uh, I think these are like 40 year olds uh, in, in Punjab before you find that it's valuable to, to allocate doses to even the elderly the most elderly people uh, in a place like Tamil Nadu. Um, we point this out. Um, I just think that politically, there's a lot of resistance to not allocating the same rate everywhere. Okay, so I said that we can do a decomposition and we can look at social demand. So this is gonna be the last result that I'm gonna present before I talk about some of the weaknesses. Um, one of the really interesting things is that if you do a standard VSL, VSLY calculation, you hold consumption constant, Every, in every kind of benefit that you're getting or all the benefits that you're getting uh, uh, is gonna be a function of changes in survival. 
But if you allow consumption to vary and your consumption comes off a, off a consumption forecasting model like we did in India, consumption changes can also contribute to value. And what we find actually in India uh, in our work is that the changes in consumption uh, actually contribute more to value than actually changes in survival. Uh, and so this is uh, uh, value of uh, vaccination each different age group. We separate this out into the portion that's due to consumption and the portion that's due to survival. Survival is the darkened areas. But again, this is log scale. Uh, and so what that's telling you is that for the for very young, it's all consumption gains that drive the value, uh, not so much survival. For the elderly, it's more survival, but there's still quite a bit from consumption. Okay. The other thing that I think is is helpful. This didn't influence policymakers that much, but this did. Uh, they, uh, policymakers want to know how many how many people how much to procure. Here, what we're doing is we're plotting not the static demand curves that change each day. There will be one for each day. Instead, we plot the dynamic demand curves that account for the fraction, the portion of each daily demand curve that you satisfy with vaccination. Um, and that's what this is plotting. So this is the percentage of the population vaccinated. This is the total economic value in US dollars. Um, what's interesting about this is uh, as you vaccinate more quickly, your valuation rises because you know, I think the dominant effect is if you vaccinate slowly, the infection is going to uh, immunize a whole bunch of the population, which reduces the incremental value of your vaccination. So that means that if you vaccinate slowly, you have lower social demand than if you vaccinate quickly. And what that also means is that for any given price, if you want to figure out how much you should procure, you'll want to procure more if you vaccinate at a high rate than if you vaccinate at a low rate. And I think that was something that, that, that did resonate uh, with folks at the Ministry of, uh, of, of uh, Finance at, at, say in Indonesia um, and uh, um, in, in India to some extent, at the state level at least. The, the way that we present this sort of stuff is obviously, you know, the academic stuff, there's a messaging component to this. The academic stuff um, uh, is kind of hard to translate. Uh, so what we typically do is we present things in, in maps, like on the left, showing the geographic variation and valuation. So here it's years of life loss uh, for India, or you give people literally tables that tell them what the valuation is for vaccinating different age groups in different districts in a state. Uh, and then they can pick and choose uh, uh, what they want to do. So let me tell you some of the weaknesses, because I think this is, you know, as you do this work, uh, it's really easy to see where uh, there's stuff that you leave on the table. Uh, so the first is, you know, we have an epi model. We we're doing this in the middle of 2021. People weren't taking reinfection as seriously. We didn't. Uh, now we're taking it a little bit more seriously, although there's debate on what a good reinfection uh, 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 categorical model looks like for simulation. You'll importantly, for the purpose of this conference, you'll notice we don't do we don't incorporate any direct behavioral response, which you could do, but and I think would be very interesting. We do do it indirectly, remember, because consumption varies uh, based upon the number of cases that there are. So it tells you that at least economic activity rather than disease infection, there's some human behavior going on. Our consumption forecasting model, I think you can quibble. We're estimating a forecast model. It's not causation, but when we reinterpret the value of vaccine, we subtly insert causation into the picture. That's clearly not true. That's just an important limitation. Um, also, we have a lot of variation in, in how we can construct that, 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 that model. And, and I'm going to point out something really interesting, which is the lockdown problem. So if you look at the uh, uh, economic activity, this is true across many countries, but India is a nice illustration. COVID hits, cases are still pretty low, and there's this massive lockdown. It happens at the very beginning. Then lockdown gets released, and then afterwards, COVID cases rises. Now, if you look at that, it's going to make it seem as if low cases are associated with worth economic out outcomes because a lockdown crushes economic activity. And so you really have to figure out, uh, or at least control for NPIs when you do this sort of estimation, uh, because it could be that you, you estimate, unless you do that, you're gonna estimate that lower, uh, lower cases associated with lower economic activity. So you wanna estimate this, you wanna at least control for that or estimate it after lockdowns end. Again, vaccination strategy, I think you could uh, uh, do a lot more interesting things, allow for geographic variation. There wasn't a lot of political demand for that, but you could. Um, I think what's really interesting is to think about private demand. In countries like India and Indonesia, the constraint wasn't so much private demand, it was supply, so we could ignore it. But as you move along over time, you're going to have to think about private demand. Uh, and I think you can account for that. Certainly if you do this, for example, in the US, uh, where hesitancy is serious. I think you can also think about considering NPIs not just in your causation, but you can actually think of it as, you know, how do what, what if I do NPIs and vaccination? I think what's interesting about NPIs is, uh, you know, uh, uh, NPIs 
have an effect on uh, vaccination. On the one hand, it increases the value of vaccination because it slows infection, increasing the value of, of immunization through vaccination. But on the other hand, it uh, actually decreases the value of vaccination because it's lowering your consumption, thus the, the willingness to pay for life. Um, so that's, I think, kind of interesting. Um, there are a bunch of lessons. I want to be uh, sensitive about uh, time. I think I'm at uh, uh, 20 minutes. So I, I can either go through this slide uh, or leave it up, uh, Flavio. You let me know. No, actually, we actually we, we are past the we are past the 25th minute. So I okay. think if you if, if you could just wrap up with a few words, then we'll take the discussion after. Okay, are you done then? Okay, great. Yeah. That that's really great. Uh, I have a bunch of questions, but I think we'll defer those to after uh, Andy's talk. So thank you very much. Uh, if you could unshare your screen, yes. Then we'll. Oh. <clears throat>